I remember him rocking me when I was sick. And I put that in the memoir, actually. The way he recounts it is that he was the only one who could ever get me to stop crying. And so he would, you know, put me on his shoulder, sing to me, and we would rock in the rocking chair. I mean, he had this song. I, I think you made it up. And it was like, he's a good old boy to me. He's a good old friend to me. And he would sing that over and over again. You know, that would always put me to sleep. And that was a real strong sense memory that I carried into writing the memoir. Because I remember thinking like there were times when dad and I were very close. I really feel like that if Christ were here today, he would be the first person out there with the holding up the sign, you know, of, you know, we love everyone. We are all inclusive. And I didn't know what was going to happen in our own church because, you know, there were several years like we never hid that Garrett was gay. But with him not living in Mountain Home, it's just not something you stand up and you go, hey, I have a son, Garrett, he's gay. Conversion therapy used to consist of anything from electroshock therapy to lobotomy to uh, this thing that they called touch therapy, where a counselor, usually a male counselor with a, a younger male, would uh, invite them into their lap, and then they would touch them. Um, and this was all based off of some hack psychology that basically said that if if you didn't receive enough touch as a kid um, from your father, then you would crave it from other men. Um, so, so there were a lot of things like that before I came to Love in Action. Mm -hmm. When I was at Love in Action, it was more like psychological torture. First couple of days, you know, you're kind of optimistic because you think, because you have been told by this, you know, the largest Southern Baptist church in the South that they have this 84% cure rate. And I'm just silly enough to believe it, you know, <laughs> because 14 years ago, I really didn't know anything about this. I had the ordination ceremony that I had to attend halfway through my conversion therapy experience. Herschel, of all times, it's his ordination ceremony. And so we have to drive on that Saturday back to the home church and all of the people from all of the missionary Baptist churches, the pastors and loved ones, family, everybody's coming. There were over 200 people coming in. And, you know, I had to stand up on a stage with my mom as the preacher who's ordaining my father says, do you promise to do everything you can to fight the sin of homosexuality in the church? And my dad says, yes. And my mom and I are standing there, you know, just on the stage while everyone's looking at us, thinking we're perfect. And I remember in that moment thinking, I'm going to break right now. And then, you know, he's asking me, you know, am I going to support Herschel and everything? And everything I was saying, I was, but I also just wasn't present. But there was this small part of me, I think, connected to that early childhood where I had love that said, you can survive this. It's there. It is there. And that, call it whatever you want, call it God's voice, call it some other voice, call it, you know, a artistic calling. We have different names for it. But I think that it first manifests itself in our lives through our early interactions. And when it's not there, it's tragedy. And then when we had to turn around and go back, all I wanted to do was just stay home and just hide Garrett away and not go back to that awful place. In the years after conversion therapy, on and off, there were some suicidal thoughts. They were never as bad as when I was involved in conversion therapy. Um, in the moment when I really was considering it, you know, I would run like the blade of a knife across my neck and like really sort of play with the idea and I really wanted to do it some nights and and after that when you don't do it and when you decide like it's either me rebuilding myself or just going ahead and doing it because a middle ground to me living a life where I'd truly been erased and where I was an automaton that idea was so repellent to me that I would rather kill myself or live my best life, you know? Right, right. It was like, you've got to do one or the other, and the middle ground is going to kill you anyway. 
And I really did cry and cry, and I prayed the wrong prayer for two years. I prayed, you know, oh, God, change him. And one day I thought to myself, you know, God answers no on a lot of our prayers. So I asked God, I said, you know, if Garrett is is who you want him to be, and if he's where you want him to be, and possibly this is as much his calling right now as Herschel's calling, and I think I just happen to be the lucky person in the middle, you know, I thought, let me know that. And all of a sudden, my heart started feeling lighter, and I, I started noticing that, you know, I really didn't want to change Garrett. He was exactly who I wanted him to be. And from that day on, I just started seeing it through both of their eyes. No, I can't be neutral. That's just not who I am. But I can love both of them. And I can show that you can still love both of them and you can still be a Christian. And that's who I feel like I am. I am, and I feel like that's who I've been called to be. And if somebody doesn't understand that, especially in the religious world, then I actually challenge them to think about what it would be if their child suddenly told them this. You you just have to have more love in your heart, and that's all God asks us to do. If you're not given enough love as a kid, it's really hard to put yourself back together later when something horrible happens because you don't know what to do. You don't have that unconditional love that tells you maybe one day it's going to be okay. You know, I was able to put myself back together again because there was some essence inside of me that said, love exists, it's there, you just have to get it back.